the first is our speaker, Professor Pete Eichhout, I had the pleasure of working with many years ago at the Court of Justice. And since then, he has been a professor of uh, European law, first at King's College London, uh, and now since 2012 at University College London. Uh, he is uh, an expert in many fields of European law, uh, has written some wonderful books and other pieces, particularly at one time in the field of external relations, but I think is now developing a great interest in constitutional aspects of the subject. And the subject this evening, of course, does raise important constitutional issues, both in terms of European constitutional law and in terms of United Kingdom constitutional law. So there's a fascinating a range of questions to be discussed, and of course it couldn't come at a more topical time with the uh, notice due to be given under Article 50 tomorrow. The only problem is there's no experience and no practice in this field. Uh, this is very much virgin territory. So all the more glad we are, I think, to have the guidance of Professor Eckhart on such an interesting and difficult range of questions. Pete. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. R rumor has it, indeed, that the Article 50 notification will be delivered tomorrow. Um, for an EU lawyer, it feels a bit like the Last Supper the night before events unfold at great speed, leading inexorably to the UK's exit from the EU's world. And there's little doubt that we will see a lot of drama over the next two years, possibly a trial and perhaps even punishment. However, my intention uh, this evening is not to paint a vivid picture imagining what may happen and what lies ahead in the bear pit of the negotiations about to start, or in truth, they actually started as far back as the 24th of June last year. My aim is a different one. Um, whatever one may think of the European Union, it is founded on the rule of law, and there is, fortunately, law governing the withdrawal process. Article 50, of course, which needs little introduction. Its provisions are on everyone's lips. They are intensely examined and commented upon, even turned upside down and inside out in efforts to squeeze just about uh, as much meaning as possible out of the article's 262 words. But such exercises, I think, quickly become sterile. One of the main aims of this lecture is to show that Article 50 does not exist in isolation, that there's a lot more law bearing on the withdrawal process, both EU law and UK law, and that Article 50 must be read in its broader legal context. Uh, I have to say this lecture is based on, on a paper I'm writing with a colleague, Dr. Eleni Franciu from Westminster University, who unfortunately is ill today. Um, it must be Brexit blues of some kind, I think, and is unable to, to join us, and she may be watching uh, on, on the live screen. Uh, and I must start by paying tribute to her co-authorship uh, and by emphasizing that most of the things I'm going to say are based on findings we uh, arrived at together. Uh, an earlier version of the paper is published uh, as a European Institute uh, working paper, and we're very grateful for the Institute's uh, support, and the final version should be published in a couple of months in a leading EU law journal. So what I aim to, articul to articulate and actually also advocate, because uh, we, we do not have any precedents um, in this lecture, is what we have called a constitutionalist interpretation of Article 50. UCL Laws has been at the forefront of the debate about how to uh, accommodate Brexit in UK constitutional law. Two colleagues, uh, Jeff King and Tom Hickman, together with Nick Barber, Oxford, uh, wrote one of the most influential blog posts of all time, I think, uh, shortly after the referendum. Their argument that uh, parliamentary legislation was required for the purpose of triggering Article 50 and that the government could not act on its own using uh, uh, the foreign affairs prerogative, was endorsed by the Divisional Court and by the Supreme Court in the famous uh, Miller litigation. 
The judgments in Miller are helpful in clarifying the relevant rules and principles of UK constitutional law. It has to be said that Parliament has not done much yet with its now confirmed powers uh, uh, to regulate and oversee Brexit. The EU Notification of Withdrawal Act 2017 simply states that the Prime Minister may notify the EU of the UK's intention to withdraw under Article 50. It does not say anything more uh, and all amendments were rejected. But that, in my view, does not mean that the Miller litigation was pointless uh, or no more than a contribution to arcane public law debates. In a minute, I will explore uh, some of the potential consequences of Miller for the Brexit process, which have, in fact, also been examined by uh, our chair in, in an important legal opinion. Uh, so this lec lecture and the pa paper on which it is based in a sense complements that focus we've seen over the last couple of months on UK constitutional law. I'm going to look at Article 50 itself, a provision of the Treaty on European Union, and will argue that this provision too requires a constitutionalist interpretation, an EU constitutionalist interpretation, that is. And that brings me to the title of the lecture, um, most things in life come at a price. Uh, Brexit, I think, will exact something of a price, and so does a, a catchy title. I'm not sure whether I'm actually going to reveal any real secrets. Um, I'm certainly uh, not sure that I will be telling any lies. I hope not. Uh, nor will I be claiming that other peoples are telling lies about Article 50. Not even alternative facts. Um, but perhaps there is scope for something like a concept of alternative legal facts um, and for the lawyers in the room to be even more precise, alternative legal interpretations. Because a lot of what has been uh, rehashed by the mainstream media, I think, uh, is really not a complete analysis and, and misses uh, quite a few of the points of looking at uh, Article 50 in, contract, in context. So I will try to offer some fresh thinking about Article 50. Uh, now, before we look into some of the components of the Article 50 process, why uh, an EU constitutionalist interpretation and what do we mean by such an interpretation? There are three broad reasons for uh, a constitutionalist reading of Article 50. First of all, its origins and its drafting process. Second, the very constitutional nature of exit from the European Union. And third, the seismic shock to the rights which people and indeed also companies have under EU law, which results from Brexit. So let me first turn to the drafting of Article 50. Uh, that was not done on Lord Kerr's kitchen table. Uh, that's an urban myth and uh, something of an alternative fact, I think. Nor, I think, was Article 50 drafted from the vantage point that it was never going to be used. Article 50 is a product of the 2002-2003 Convention on the Future of Europe, which penned the ill-fated constitutional treaty. And the travaux, um, the proceedings of that convention, are publicly available. And our re research shows that Article 50 was taken very seriously. There isn't an accompany accompanying memorandum or anything like that, but there are a whole series of proposed amendments to the original draft uh, which members of the convention put forward. Uh, and most of them were not accepted, but they nonetheless shed light on the basic conception of the ultimate provision Article 50 as we know it today. Um, the vagueness that characterizes Article 50 and which has been much, much commented upon was linked to the delegates' uh, inability to reach agreement concerning the strictness of the withdrawal process. And this can be attributed to the very different perspectives on the goals and nature of the then constitutional treaty. The clause was inserted uh, in light of the fact that the United Kingdom disagreed with the political aspiration of a closer union that the Constitution set in motion. So I think the United Kingdom was always in view when Article 50 was drafted and negotiated. Um, in turn, member states that supported the constitutionalization project at the time, such as Germany, had actively opposed its insertion. That opposition was shared by most of the other founding states as well as by EU institutions. 
Notably, a group of representatives from the European Parliament had proposed that if the provision were maintained, uh, further safeguards should be added to ensure that it does not privilege the withdrawing state. They had argued, for example, that the article should balance the ability to leave with the power for the Union to expel a member state. Um, a series of other amendments intended to render withdrawal more difficult, more cumbersome, were proposed, for example, by Dominique de Villepin, who uh, rep represented France. He suggested that withdrawal should be made conditional on a form of irreconcilable differences between the withdrawing state and the EU following a treaty change. Uh, and it should be required that the solution be sought within the European Council first. He also asked that the limitation period be introduced before a state would be able to join again before reaccession. Uh, now, generally, it, uh, we conclude from our analysis of these travaux uh, of the Convention that Article 50, Paragraph 1, is the key to the withdrawal process. Um, as long as a member state has decided in accordance with its own constitutional requirements to withdraw, uh, that is the only condition imposed on a member state notifying the European Council of this intention, of this decision and its intention to leave and then to allow the member state to negotiate its future relationship with the Union. Uh, this is not to say that there are no limitations on, on what can be negotiated. I will, be return, I'll, I will return to that as part of a future relationship uh, on the part of the EU. But EU law, Article 50, clearly recognizes the freedom for the withdrawing state. The withdrawal process envisaged is not subject uh, to specific conditions. Um, the fact that clauses for further limiting the provision had been proposed in the negotiations and enjoyed some support nonetheless merits further discussion. The text of Article 50 was in fact changed substantially from the first draft to the final one uh, in the Constitutional Treaty, and then it was kept in the Lisbon Treaty. While the first draft did not contain any limitations on the withdrawing state's reaccession to the Union, two important provisos were added in the Constitution's final draft. First, that the two-year period for the negotiations could only be extended by unanimity in the European Council. Um, and second, that a state wishing to withdraw would need to make a new application for accession after it has withdrawn. This, uh, in our view, suggests that the broad discretion allowed in respect of the unilateral withdrawal decision in the provision's opening paragraph was intended to be counterbalanced first by conditions intended to prevent the withdrawing state holding the Union hostage in the negotiations, and second by the insertion of disincentives for using Article 50. And both of these restrictions were intended to guard against the possibility of triggering Article 50 in a politically opportunistic fashion uh, or by opponents of Europe in the member states, uh, as the proceedings record, a key concern for those who opposed its insertion. So the drafting process of Article 50 reveals the constitutional type concerns which animated those involved in its creation. Indeed, Article 50 is of a constitutional character not only because of its origins uh, and in a formal sense, but also, of course, in substantive te terms. To paraphrase Bruce Ackerman, when considering what's the constitution of the Union uh, actually constitutes, it would be impossible not to make reference to membership of and distancing from that union. One can hardly Im imagine provisions that are more constitutional in character than those concerning the makeup, objectives, membership, and withdrawal from the European Union. In regulating the latter process, Article 50 is directly constitutive of what the European Union is. Also, the interpretation of Article 50 uh, clearly affects the Union's very identity as a constitutional order committed to a number of constitutional values, which are enumerated in Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union, and I quote, uh, respect for human dignity, freedom, equality, democracy, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. It's indeed obvious that a national decision such as Brexit uh, and the process of withdrawal that it triggers 
raise concerns about the degree of respect for many of those values. Extricating the United Kingdom from the acquis communautaire is a complex, wide-ranging and intrusive legal exercise which raises questions of respect for constitutional guarantees relating to, for example, acquired rights and the rule of law. And this brings me to the third reason for a constitutionalist reading. The degree to which the rights of citizens are at stake in the Article 50 process puts the need for such a reading we think most sharply into focus. These rights are not confined to human or fundamental rights. The direct effect of EU law, be it in the form of provisions in the EU treaties or in EU legislation, uh, this direct effect is an enormous rights generating factory. And the system of rights is not a theoretical legal construct, it's part and parcel of the daily lives of millions of people both in the UK and elsewhere in the European Union. Indeed, the, the rights that uh, EU law generates and confers are, are beyond enumeration or even classification. They are scattered throughout all EU policies uh, and thousands of pieces of, of legislation. And what follows is, is really strictly illustrative, um, but uh, I think it's interesting to paint something of a picture. There are rights to free trade in goods and in services. There are rights to free movement of capital, freedom of establishment. There's, of course, rights to free movement of persons, which are accompanied by rights to work, to reside, not to be discriminated against on grounds of nationality. There are, in EU law, broader rights to equality. There are political rights. There are employment and social rights. There are consumer rights, environmental rights, rights to agricultural subsidies, uh, rights to have foreign judgments enforced, rights of immigration and family reunification, rights to privacy and data protection, and that's just the beginning of a list we could go on for a long time. And overarching all of those rights is the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which proclaims a number of these rights to be fundamental and ensures their respect within the scope of application of EU law. Of course, Brexit does not mean that all of those rights will be lost. The UK government is proposing to put a great repeal bill before Parliament which, contrary to its heading, uh, would keep most EU law on the statute book uh, as a post-Brexit starting point. However, some rights will inevitably be lost as the Miller litigation established. For example, the right to vote for the European Parliament and to stand as a candidate in European Parliament election. And other rights are clearly <coughs> contingent on how the future relationship is constructed. That relationship can never keep all rights resulting from full membership intact, for else Brexit would make no sense. Um, the retained rights may be incorporated into domestic law in the United Kingdom, but they will no longer benefit from the direct effect and primacy of EU law. Moreover, what I think could also be lost is a certain level of entrenchment of EU law rights, particularly but not exclusively those which flow from the EU treaties and the Charter. This level of entrenchment is a function of the high political threshold for obtaining any amendment, let alone termination of such rights. If you look at the free movement rights, they are uh, in the treaties, have been since 1957, uh, and it's very unlikely that the European Union would ever rescind them. Uh, the process is a cumbersome one. All member states have to agree in accordance with their constitutional requirements. Uh, and even rights which merely result from EU secondary legislation may be more difficult to amend than rights conferred by UK domestic legislation. Uh, this entrenchment of EU law rights, uh, in our view, has a strong counter-majoritarian streak. For example, even if uh, we would accept that many EU citizens who have benefited from free movement could be regarded as part of globalization's elites, they do constitute a minority in fundamental rights terms in any country where they are residing. And the Brexit referendum campaign, vote and subsequent developments uh, do pose a threat to their rights in a variety of ways. So these are in some, uh, some of the reasons for the constitutionalist interpretation of Article 50. But what does such a constitutionalist reading then entail? We first of all, and this is only a quick sketch, we first of all agree with uh, Thomas Strines who's written that the Brexit process itself 
must be a cooperative one, uh, since the duty of cooperation enshrined in Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Treaty on European Union continues to bind the EU institutions, the United Kingdom and the other member states for as long as Brexit is not complete. The guiding principle in the negotiations for a withdrawal agreement must therefore be respect for EU constitutional law and the rule of law and the protection of rights are paramount in this regard. But a constitutionalist reading requires more than that. It also requires respect uh, for, e for other EU values, such as democracy, which, which points to the role of parliaments in the process. It further needs to be consistent with the principles governing the division of competences between the EU and its member state. And it also means that when it comes to defining the EU's future relationship with the United Kingdom as a non-member state, a third country, as we call it in EU law, the negotiations need to take account of what are the core objectives of the EU's external action, as it's called in the treaties. And these include also the promotion of the EU's values and interests, the protection of its citizens and human rights, and also free and fair trade. So this is the first part of my lecture, the reasons for a constitutionalist reading and what such a reading may entail and what um, sort of question should be looked at. In the second part, I'd like to suggest some of the more specific consequences uh, in no particular order and in view of the time constraint, mostly uh, in outline form. The consequences for actually how to look at Article 50 uh, uh, and its components. First, um, we argue for a strong preference for a deal over a no deal. It's clear from the travaux of the Constitutional Treaty that the basic constitutional concept is that exit from the EU must always be possible, even if at the end of the negotiations there is no deal. There is ultimately nothing the EU can, can do to stop the withdrawing state from leaving. However, a no deal withdrawal clearly offends all that EU constitutional law holds dear in terms of rights protection, the rule of law, and the duty of cooperation. Uh, we think that the counterpart to the unilateral right of withdrawal must be to read Article 50 as embodying an exceptionally strong preference for a negotiated, orderly, and well-transitioned withdrawal over the no-deal outcome. And this is perfectly in line with how the European Union generally handles constitutional crises. The history of those crises shows that invariably the EU goes to great lengths to find a negotiated settlement of some kind. Uh, think of the social rights chapter at Maastricht for which the, e the UK got an opt-out, the creation of the Euro and of Schengen, justice and home affairs, integration, again opt-outs for the UK were agreed, um, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights with a protocol clarifying its legal position in this country and in Poland. Think of the first Irish referendum on the Lisbon Treaty and the response of the European Union to that or the Danish opt-outs. And for those with very long memories, uh, even Germany's signing of the original EEC treaty um, 60 years ago was contingent at the last minute on the adoption of a special protocol on trade not in German cars, but in bananas, imports of bananas into the European Union. Uh, so again, if the United Kingdom were intent on walking out uh, of the negotiations, that could not be stopped. But we argue that the EU in those negotiations is under a constitutional obligation to do all it can to avoid this. Second point on uh, Article 50, um, the nature and content of the withdrawal agreement and of uh, any agreement setting out and determining the future relationship. Uh, a first question here is the extent to which the withdrawal agreement could itself regulate the future relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union. The wording of Article 50, paragraph 2, instructs the negotiators to take account of the framework for the future relationship. These are fairly enigmatic terms in that they do not spell out what is meant by this framework, nor whether that framework needs to be part of a separate agreement. Textually, I think all that can be said is that the withdrawal agreement should include references to the future relationship. 
however, we think it's less obvious to read Article 50 as conferring a competence on the EU to regulate in the withdrawal agreement itself under Article 50, both the terms of withdrawal and the full organization of the future relationship. That would appear to involve substantially more than setting out the arrangements for withdrawal. That's what Article 50 provides. Nevertheless, we would note that agreements concluded by the European Union may have more than one provision in the EU treaties as their legal basis. In terms of EU legal principle, we really do not see any significant barriers to a withdrawal agreement which also regulates the future relationship and is in that respect uh, based on, uh, on a different provision in the treaties, different from Article 50. For example, if that uh, uh, agreement were confined to trade matters, Article 207 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union would constitute the relevant provision. If, however, the future relationship uh, includes a range of EU policy areas in which the United Kingdom may wish to continue to cooperate with the EU, as could perhaps be expected, notwithstanding all the talk about a hard Brexit, then an association pursuant to Article 217 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union ought to be considered. The provision on, uh, on associations, Article 217, is about as vague as Article 50, in that an association is barely defined. It involves, and I quote, reciprocal rights and obligations, common action and special procedure. But the Court of Justice has determined uh, quite a long time ago already that an association agreement uh, and the legal basis in the treaties uh, for concluding association agreements empowered the European Union to guarantee, and I quote again, commitments towards non-member countries in all the fields covered by the treaties. The competence to conclude association agreement is, in substantive terms, the broadest external competence for which the EU treaties provide. Uh, and the judgment in which the court confirmed that, a case called de Mirel, dating from 1987, is telling in this respect. It accepted that the association agreement with Turkey could provide for some measure of free movement of workers, even if at the time there was no express competence in the field of immigration from third countries that had been conferred up upon the European Economic Community. Today we have some provisions on immigration in the treaties. In 1987 there were none. Nevertheless, because the, the EU internally provides for free movement of workers, the European Court of Justice considered that also an association agreement could enter that territory. So an association agreement with the United Kingdom could, uh, in our view, guarantee commitments really in uh, any and all of the fields covered by the treaties. Um, so we consider that um, uh, an agreement which regulates both withdrawal and the future relationship is legally conceivable. There is an alternative view or, or an alternative fact. Um, it's often heard, I haven't seen it in print. The argument is uh, the following. Um, that uh, an association or trade agreement regulating the future relationship um, would be an agreement that can only be negotiated and concluded under the treaty with a third country, a non-member state, which is Article 218, is the Article 218 on the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, it's been referred to recently in a lot of commentary, is, the, is actually the, the general provision which lays down how the European Union negotiates and concludes international agreements. One could say that the UK, by contrast, remains a member state in the course of the withdrawal process, and the withdrawal agreement could therefore be seen as a sui generis type of agreement, uh, one with an existing member state, but regulating its exit from the EU. Article 50, as the legal basis for such a sui generis agreement, could then not be combined with a legal basis regulating the future relationship with the UK later on in its capacity of a third country. And I believe that's the opinion which the institutions in Brussels are currently uh, signing up to. In our, in our view, that distinction uh, does not survive closer scrutiny. Uh, if you read Article 50 carefully, Article 50, paragraph 3, conceives of the actual entry into force of the withdrawal agreement as going, coinciding with actual Brexit. 
the UK being released from its treaty obligations, losing its member state status and becoming a third country. It's at that point in time that the withdrawal agreement will enter into force. So in my view, the withdrawal agreement regulates the future relationship just as much as any other agreement would. Just think of one of the uh, likely core features of this withdrawal agreement, uh, the protection of the rights of EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens in the European Union. Uh, this protection will be, uh, if it's agreed, an element of the future relationship between the EU and the UK, just as much as any potential decision to set up a free trade area. Um, of course, the withdrawal agreement will be negotiated when the UK continues to be a member state, but what matters in legal terms, in our view, is the nature of the international commitments undertaken at the point of conclusion and entry into force. The withdrawal agreement is of necessity predicated on the UK becoming a third country and in that respect indistinguishable from a trade or association agreement with the UK based on either Article 207 or 217 and negotiated in accordance with the provisions of Article 218. So it should be possible to have one single agreement. Whether there is enough time is another matter, but I may come to that in a second. Third point. Matters of EU and member state competence. Our view is that it's doubtful whether the determination of the future relationship requires a so-called mixed agreement, an agreement which is concluded both by the EU but also by each individual member state and therefore needs to be approved by as many parliaments as member states care to uh, provide for. In the case of my home country, Belgium, uh, quite a few. Uh, such mixed agreements uh, reflect the EU the cardinal EU constitutional principle of limited and conferred powers. As clearly stated in Article 5, Paragraph 2, the Treaty on European Union, competences not conferred upon the Union in the treaties remain with the member states. But withdrawal, in our view, is quite a special case. In all matters covered by the treaties, the EU member states have effectively conferred their powers to regulate their relationship with the United Kingdom on the EU, simply by virtue of the UK's current membership. Take immigration again as an example. The EU's current competences to regulate immigration of third country nationals are clearly defined and they leave the substance of immigration policies to national competence to the member states. However, as far as, as current UK citizens are concerned, there is at pre present no such national competence because UK citizens are EU citizens uh, up to the point of Brexit benefiting from free movement. So if a full agreement on the future relationship were to be reached in the course of the withdrawal process, it's difficult to see any strict legal reasons for a mixed agreement. It's difficult to see member states arguing that the, the EU cannot exercise some of their competences since all of these matters are already fully regulated by EU law. Um, and the EU's implied powers doctrine may be relevant here, uh, but to analyze this further here in this lecture would really take us too long and chase, I think, a number of people out of the room as well, given the complexity of the relevant case law. But it's a point worth considering further, I think. Uh, fourth point, the role of the UK Parliament at the end of the withdrawal process. Government has said that Parliament will be asked to approve the agreement, but that, that if it votes it down, there will simply be no deal. Uh, complying with Miller, as you know, the government put the European Union notification of withdrawal bill before Parliament. House of Lords proposed uh, two amendments, one of which provided for a second vote in Parliament after an agreement had been negotiated, but the House of Commons rejected those amendments. Now, the second amendment passed by the House of Lords raises a vital constitutional issue, which in fact was not addressed, uh, in our view, in the Miller judgment. The Supreme Court did not really examine what the fulfillment of the UK's constitutional requirement of parliamentary sovereignty entails, uh, other than saying that the notification, that was the issue in the case, that the notification required a, 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 stat a statute um, and to say that the, the change in the law 
which the implementation of the result of the referendum requires, must be made in the only way in which the UK Constitution permits, namely through parliamentary legislation. The Supreme Court refrained from looking further into this question, stating that, uh, and I quote, what form such legislation should take is entirely a matter for Parliament. But does this mean that Parliament could, through a single act, the Notification of Withdrawal Act, give carte blanche to the government to negotiate the UK's withdrawal? Or must Parliament be in a position to vote on the terms of the agreement itself? in a way which does not involve a mere rubber stamping. There's a powerful uh, legal opinion about, written by our chair together with Sir David Edwards, a uh, former judge at the European Court of Justice, Sir Jeremy Lever, Helen Mountfield, and, and Jerry Facena, which takes the view that Parliament needs to act also at the end of the withdrawal process, needs to approve the withdrawal agreement, or if there is no withdrawal agreement, needs to decide to leave without a deal, or indeed could decide not to leave at all. The opinion bases this on the fact that it's the withdrawal agreement which will ultimately determine the fate of current uh, rights under EU law in this country as they are part of UK domestic law. The mere parliamentary authorization uh, uh, of the Article 50 notification is insufficient, the argument goes, because that does not determine any actual changes to UK law upon withdrawal. For example, there could be continued free movement of persons between the UK and the European Union in a withdrawal agreement, and there could be uh, a complete ban on free movement of persons in a future uh, relationship. Uh, we, we simply do not know at, at this time, and this will affect the law of the country, uh, because EU law rights are part of domestic law. So under the UK Constitution, um, so on the basis of Miller, the authors argue that a valid constitutional decision to withdraw in accordance with the principle of parliamentary sovereignty must be seen as a process rather than as a decision taken at a defined point in time. Uh, under the UK Constitution, that decision is conditional on ultimate parliamentary approval and it's only at the end of the Article 50 negotiations when the terms are clear, that there can be a final decision on such withdrawal. That's a, a, an opinion on the current state of United Kingdom law. Under EU law, the question that the Edward opinion, if I may call it uh, that, raises is whether their understanding of the UK's constitutional requirements can be reconciled with the terms of Article 50. On a bare reading of Article 50, the decision to withdraw, paragraph one, and its notification, which starts the two-year period, paragraph two, are sequential. However, we, we would argue that a constitutionalist interpretation of Article 50 requires the EU to pay deep and genuine respect for the withdrawing member states' constitutional requirements. If those requirements mean, uh, as is argued in the opinion, if I understand it correctly, that the ultimate withdrawal decision can only be taken once the terms of the withdrawal agreement and of the future relations between the state, the withdrawing state and the EU are fully known, then also the European Union should respect this. I think this conception has merit in particular because it's really only in the face of sufficient knowledge of the terms of withdrawal that a fully considered decision can be taken. The Brexit debate amply shows this in the sense that the sharpest critique of the referendum is that voters were unable to know what the terms of Brexit were going to be. Moreover, there is some support, we think, in, uh, for this reading in the text of Article 50, in the sense that paragraph 2 refers to the notification not of the decision to withdraw, but notification of the intention to withdraw. Uh, so in the specific context of Brexit, withdrawal may need to be looked at as a process more than as a punctual decision. Uh, my fifth point, the role of the European Parliament. Article 50, paragraph 2 requires the consent of the European Parliament for the conclusion of the withdrawal agreement. What if the European Parliament refuses such consent? Does that mean there is no deal or is the EU negotiator, the Commission, then required to go back to the negotiating table? It's kind of the equivalent issue to the role of the um, UK Parliament. 
We think that a constitutionalist reading of Article 50 favors the latter position, a renegotiate. The involvement of the European Parliament reflects the EU's democratic principles, um, more specifically the principle of representative democracy with EU citizens being directly represented at EU level in the European Parliament. It would hardly be res respectful of these principles if the European Parliament could only rubber stamp the agreement if its refusal to give its consent meant that there would simply be no exit deal, the consequences of which are likely to be far worse than the terms and conditions of any withdrawal agreement. At this point, I may perhaps allow myself to lift the veil of academic peer review processes. We've submitted this paper to a journal, and one reviewer has just sent us the comment. It's anon anonymous, so I'm, I'm actually not revealing many secrets. Um, uh, he sent us the comment that, or she, that there is no parliamentary power to propose amendments. That's true. Article 50 says that the European Parliament must give its consent. It doesn't say that the Parliament can uh, amend and participate in the negotiations. Uh, and therefore, the reviewer says, the normal expectation is that parliaments use their ultimate power of veto to influence the negotiations informally in advance. Now, with greatest respect to the reviewer, uh, we think this comment uh, really misses the point of the unique nature of the withdrawal process and the withdrawal agreement. When, for example, the European Parliament some years ago refused to give its consent to an agreement with the United States on passenger name records, um, as, it, as it did, there was simply no agreement as a result, and therefore no change in the law or in the EU's international commitments. And it was for the Commission to go back to the negotiations with the US to try to accommodate Parliament's concerns. That's the kind of standard process of parliamentary involvement when they have to consent, when a Parliament has to consent to a particular agreement. If there is, it's the same, in fact, with, uh, with any amend amendments to the EU treaties or any accessions to the European Union. All Parliaments in all Member States need to uh, agree with that, and if just one Parliament says no, uh, the status quo is the same, nothing changes, and we do not have an amendment or an accession. Withdrawal is, is the reverse. If the European Parliament were to refuse to give its consent to the withdrawal agreement, uh, for example, and this is purely hypothetical, of course, for example, because it may be dissatisfied with the level of protection of e EU citizens who currently reside in the United Kingdom, uh, and if then the consequences of uh, refusing that consent is that there is no agreement at all, it will create, of course, a far worse position for these uh, uh, EU citizens. So putting a parliament with its back against the wall, we think, is really not in conformity with democratic principles uh, and with the constitutionalist reading of Article 50. My sixth point, and the quick thinkers among you are already pondering this, um, what I have been saying may sound right in principle, not sure whether you agree with it, but how on earth could there be sufficient time to get back to the negotiating table in case either the UK Parliament or the European Parliament are unhappy with the results. Article 50 provides for a two-year peri period and then the UK is definitively out. Or not. We're not so sure about this. As mentioned, it's clear that Article 50 is intended to privilege the reaching of an agreement. The ticking clock in the provision is proceeding by the words failing that. It talks about the entry into force of a the negotiation and entry into force of a withdrawal agreement and failing that, the two-year period kicks in. This suggests that this is really a kind of fallback option. Uh, and this reading of Article 50 in our view does not conflict with its terms. Indeed, the term failing that can be read as referring to the complete failure to negotiate and, and thus conclude a withdrawal agreement in the first place. It could happen that in a year's time, the UK and the, EU and the EU just say, it's not working, we're just not going to have any agreement. But where there actually is an agreement which has been negotiated and which has been signed and then goes to the UK Parliament, goes to the European Parliament, uh, in our view, the two-year period ought to be regarded as suspended uh, until the agreement is finally concluded and enters into force. It's really only in the case of a complete breakdown in the negotiations that exit without a withdrawal agreement would ensue. The reason of the two-year time frame was, um, in Article 50, was to clarify that the withdrawing state is under no obligation of further 
uh, association with the union, as well as to ensure that neither party is able to stall the negotiations. But it cannot be read as entailing the brushing aside of any effective parliamentary scrutiny once an agreement is found, or be used as a means of compelling the legislature to accept whatever agreement is put on the table. My seventh point, is the Article 50 notification revocable? Um, after tomorrow, could the United Kingdom still change its mind? This is a, a much discussed que question, um, and uh, we've thought about it a long time. I hesitated over the summer. Um, ultimately, I think we are uh, of the view, together with, uh, I think, a majority of commentators, uh, that uh, it should be possible to uh, reverse the process. The wording of Article 50 does not offer much help when it comes to uh, revo revocability. After stating that a member state may decide to withdraw, uh, Article 50 stipulates that the member, in, in, in member state in question shall notify the European Council of its intention. Thus, Article 50 clearly distinguishes between the decision to withdraw, paragraph 1, and its notification under paragraph 2. Now, while, as Jean-Claude Pires has put it, uh, intentions can change, it has to be recognized that Article 50, paragraph 2, does not concern the notification of a mere political intention, but of an intention based on a decision to withdraw taken in accordance with the member state's constitutional requirements. And the notification, of course, has a clear legal meaning and effect, um, namely the commencen commencement of this two-year period for uh, exit and negotiation. Nevertheless, um, we think that, that this distinction between the decision to withdraw and its notification is a critical one. A member state uh, is entitled to decide in accordance with its constitutional requirements to withdraw from the European Union. That's unconditional. If that member state reconsidered that decision within the two-year time frame, uh, we think it would be unconstitutional for the European Union not to accept uh, such a bona fide revocation of the notification. The reference to constitutional requirements of the member state in Article 51 su suggests that in order to revoke the notification, the withdrawing state would simply need to show that the decision to withdraw is no longer compatible with its constitutional requirements in that a new decision has been taken. Um, that could mean the rejection of the decision to withdraw by parliament only or by Parliament after a new referendum. Uh, but of course, under the UK Constitution, the, 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 the core principle is, is fairly clear, parliamentary sovereignty and no Parliament can bind another Parliament. Um, so um, it must be emphasized that in order for a new decision not to withdraw, to reverse the withdrawal process, that decision would need to be about withdrawal altogether and not about the rejection of any specific agreement. Um, against that view, it could be said that there's a need to avoid abuse of the Article 50 process. But the possibility of, of abuse would be prevented by the requirement that withdrawal of the notification should be in good faith. If a member state could not withdraw its notification after genuinely changing its mind and was thus forced to leave upon the conclusion of the two-year period, that would effectively amount to expulsion from the European Union. And uh, this was a possibility that was considered and rejected when Article 50 was drafted. It would also be contrary to the principles of good faith, loyal cooperation, and the Union's commitment to respect the Member State's constitutional identities, all of which are constitutional principles requiring respect by the EU institutions. Eight point and last, but by no means least, um, the protection of the rights of EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens in the European Union. This is a vital question with a range of sub-questions, uh, dimensions and issues which would need to be looked at and in just a few remaining min minutes I really cannot do it any justice. So let me just say a few things about a constitutionalist approach towards such protection. Insofar as the United Kingdom is concerned and the rights of EU nationals in the United EU citizens in the United Kingdom. Uh, it must, of course, be pointed out that the ECHR, the European Convention on Human Rights, protects the right to reside and the right to family life of those who have made meaningful ties in the host state uh, and construes these concepts broadly. 
Um, it is clear to us that Article 8 of the Convention will therefore be engaged should, for example, the UK wish to expel EU citizens. Uh, moreover, the European Convention level of protection of the rights to private and family life must be maintained in our view, uh, must at least be maintained in the withdrawal agreement. Any agreement between the EU and the UK that does not meet this level will be challengeable under both UK and EU law uh, because effectively the Convention is also binding on the European Union. It's also clear that precisely the same uh, considerations apply to UK nationals currently resident in uh, uh, EU member states. All of the EU member states are signatories uh, to the Convention and respect for the Convention rights has underpinned the, court, the case law of the Court of Justice uh, uh, on fundamental rights from its early years and the Convention rights are effectively also in the Charter. In fact, the main interpretative issues in this field do not concern this minimum. Rather, they pertain to the extent to which the rights to private and family life must be guaranteed in the sense in which they are understood in the UK and the, and the EU so far as they are understood at present in EU law, not just in Convention law. It's clear that for EU institutions and remaining member states, the relevant interpretation of these rights will be not just that of the Convention, but that of the EU treaties, which provide for free movement and non-discrimination on grounds of nationality, and of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which also uh, confirms the right to private and family life and the right to free movement for EU citizenship. Um, so, for example, uh, on, on the issue of family reunification, EU law has offered EU citizens the opportunity to reunite with their core family members as well as other dependent family members, uh, both from within the EU and from third countries in a way which surpasses the requirements of the Convention. It's also offered them, of course, the right to non-discrimination on grounds of nationality. This is what the debate about the maintenance of private and family life should therefore focus on. Um, I could say quite a bit more about, about this aspect and might come up in questions, um, but I would leave it here for the moment as to my specific points on the Article 50 process. To conclude, um, allow me perhaps just to say that uh, much of the current political discourse on withdrawal, particularly here in the UK, but, but also um, on the continent to some degree, stands in quite stark contrast with the constitutionalist approach to Article 50, which we are advocating. The process of exit and withdrawal is spoken of in purely intergovernmental terms, with the overriding aim of reaching the best deal for Britain, particularly in respect of economic implications. Such a discourse, in our view, completely disregards uh, the fact that Brexit involves this really seismic shock to individual rights, a shock whose severity depends on the outcome of the Article 50 process. That process, in turn, uh, is by definition concerned not with the best deal for Britain, but with, uh, or ought to be concerned, with respect for the EU and UK constitutional orders. A constitutionalist reading of Article 50 brings into sharper relief uh, the fact that the withdrawal process cannot be one that is entirely at the mercy of politics. Ultimately, what makes a constitutionalist rather than a purely intergovernmental approach to Article 50 most appealing is that, the, in fact, the constitutional orders of the UK and the U European Union largely converge on, most, uh, on many of the most crucial constitutional issues. Legislation, not only in the EU, but also in the UK, protects, for example, against the use of nationality as a discriminatory premise. Uh, the right for Parliament to make the law, uh, or at least be involved uh, in the making of the law, is the same in the, in the United Kingdom, in fact stronger uh, as it is in the European Union. Uh, furthermore, UK courts have generally so far been deeply mindful of the need to respect acquired rights and legal certainty. Uh, so we hope that our paper and this lecture uh, contributes something to uh, a Brexit process which is orderly, constitution respectful of uh, those constitutional orders and in line with the constitutionalist reading of Article 50. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much, um, Professor Eichhout. Uh, that is, I think, uh, a quite exceptional and extraordinary lecture. And it seems to me that the constitutionalist approach that has been adopted uh, is particularly welcome, as um, the lecturer pointed out in the current atmosphere, mm -hmm. where there does not seem to be much regard to constitutional principle, or one might say even to law. Uh, it seems to me that the ideas expressed in this lecture will be exceptionally influential over the next two years. Um, I think there's been still remarkably little attention paid to these issues. Um, I have no doubt that at least some who are involved in the negotiation will now be led to revise some of their ideas uh, in the light of the uh, lecture and the paper which will appear in the legal journal. So I think we've been rather privileged to be present at this event. This is really something which we at least must hope will have some impact on the course of events over the next two years. Now, we have time for some, uh, a few questions. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please uh, indicate. And um, could I say, um, there are roving microphones, so please wait until the roving microphone reaches you. If you could start, please also let us know your name. Uh, thank you, Joshua Rosenberg. Um, I'm sure we'd all support the constitutionalist interpretation that you're calling for, but how would you enforce that two years down the road? Uh, if the EU negotiators uh, don't take the same point of view. Uh, to take Francis Jacobs' opinion that uh, he and the others um, expressed, um, what happens um, uh, when we get two years down the road and uh, we have, let's say, uh, a failure to pass the legislation that uh, we're promised, failure to pass the Great Repeal Bill, failure to approve the terms of the deal, um, uh, what happens if we decide that we want to argue that Article 50 is reversible um, uh, uh, two years down the road and the EU is against that? Might we get to the stage where under, under UK law uh, we might say, well, we haven't complied with our constitutional requirements, we're still in the EU, but under EU law we would be out of the EU? And what can we do about that? And who's going to enforce our claim to be part of the EU uh, when the EU thinks we're out of it? Because after all, if it was as easy as this, then we wouldn't have needed Miller because you know, once the bullet's fired tomorrow on the argument of Miller, it hits its target inevitably in two years' time. Do you want to take um, a question now? Questions or should we'll take one or two more like questions <laughs> and then we'll have a reply, yes. So, um, uh, yes, please. Andrew Smith, uh, you mentioned uh, that it, it's interesting to look at the, uh, the, the amendments, proposed amendments to Article 50 where they're rejected, and you mentioned a few of them. I just wanted to know if there were any other interesting ones that just didn't fall into your, your seven points or whatever it was that uh, is worth us uh, knowing about. And maybe we'll take just one more question. Yes, the gentleman at the back there, please. Hi, uh, so Ronan McRae from UCL. Thanks, that was great. I, I really liked your point about the possible lack of a necessity for a mixed agreement because the EU already has competence on these matters. But my question is, what would happen then to the voting rules for the adoption of the agreement under Article 50? because that agreement will touch on areas that although the EU has competence over them, the voting rules for amending that legislation, as with free movement, require unanimity, mm. whereas the uh, Article 50 provisions say qualified majority. So which voting rules would then apply? Thanks. Thank, thank you very much for those questions. Um, question of enforceability is, uh, is an immense one, I think. I mean, th there's certainly quite clearly, and we thought about that, um, it's one thing to argue that there, is, uh, that there are legal principles which govern a particular process. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that they are easily enforceable before a court of law. 
What I have not mentioned in the, in the talk and we would include in the paper is that um, next to the European Parliament being involved in the withdrawal, um, approving the withdrawal agreement, there's also a scope, uh, it seems, under, under the EU treaties for any member state or any institution of the European Union to ask the European Court of Justice for its opinion on the compatibility of the agreement with the founding treaties. Um, that is a general competence which the EU has, for example, the, which the EU Court of Justice has, for example. It is currently looking at uh, these questions of, of mixity in the context of the EU-Singapore free trade agreement and some of its findings there might be relevant to a Brexit agreement uh, as well. Um, it's a, a general provision part of Article 218 and I, I cannot see any reasons why it could not apply also to the withdrawal agreement. Um, what is a little unfortunate about that process is that the European Court of Justice has never uh, in fact uh, declared that such a request for an opinion uh, suspends the process of approving the agreement. So in theory it seems possible for the uh, EU and the UK to go ahead anyway to conclude the agreement and then the case would lapse uh, under existing principle. I would argue that that should not be the position adopted. but. Uh, that is one possible way of involving the EU Court of Justice. The President of the EU Court of Justice has said that he, can, he cannot begin to think of the numerous ways in which Brexit may come before the EU Court of Justice. Whether that was necessarily a very helpful statement, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I, I would generally ag agree with it. Um, uh, and likewise with um, um, any potential litigation in, in this country, I mean, I. I really would not want to try to put up a crystal ball and gaze in it and, and try to divine what the next Miller case might look like. Uh, but we have seen, uh, I mean, Miller is a good lesson, I think, the initial reaction to the Miller litigation when it was started uh, over the summer by most uh, public lawyers here in this country was, uh, this will not go anywhere, the courts will not want to look at it. Uh, it's clear that the government can act, this is really a political issue which cannot be brought before the courts and, and we saw what the outcome was. So, um, and um, of course none of that can be done without delaying the process but uh, uh, better to get a good Brexit than, uh, than, than a quick one in my personal view. Um, as to the question on any other amendments, a uh, good question. I, I fear I don't have them all in, in my head at present. Uh, but uh, in our paper, we discuss, we discuss a few more, and we really took out those which told us something about the sort of debates going on in, in the process. I mean, they were, they were mostly sort of centered, the amendments on uh, the, um, what would uh, give an opportunity to a member state to withdraw. Uh, in fact, some even suggested that the EU could itself actively use it against a, a particular member state, uh, which might not live up to a the requirements of EU law uh, and violate the rule of law and so on. Um, there, there were really quite quite a big range of them, uh, but I think I've mentioned sort of the, the gist of them. Um, on the questions of uh, uh, not having a mixed agreement and, and what are the voting rules, um, I think the orthodox approach on, on the EU law is to distinguish between the, the legal basis for concluding an international agreement and the voting rules which apply to that particular agreement. And for example, if there were an, uh, an agreement uh, both regulating withdrawal, uh, that requires uh, this super qualified majority in the Council of Ministers. If that were combined with an association agreement, an association agreement requires unanimity in the Council of Ministers. Um, and there is case law by the EU Court of Justice on, on when you can and you cannot combine these different legal provisions uh, which used to be uh, fairly restrictive and in recent years has been a, become a bit more open. So I, I think um, if we were to have such an agreement, uh, withdrawal plus association, you would simply move from effectively for that agreement from the uh, uh, qualified majority in Article 50 to a requirement of, of uh, consensus unanimity among the member states. But of course unanimity among the member states does not mean that each individual member state then has to bring it before their own parliament. It's just a decision by uh, the Council of Ministers. Um, of course, any legislation which is then needed to implement uh, any of these agreements 
uh, has to respect the specific provisions on adopting that legislation under the EU. And there, there may well be uh, also requirements or unanimity that depends on the matters which are regulated by the agreement. I think that's how I would see it. Or well, there might be a, there might be a risk of a referendum in some state, there might which be. might prejudice the entry into force of the agreement. Yes. So, uh, there's been some experience of that, hasn't there, in uh, recent years? So there, there are there are some uh, pitfalls ahead, perhaps. Yes, then. Uh, question over here. Thank you. Uh, Nick Stone. I'd read today in the papers that. Um, the European Court of Justice could be the final arbiter and enforcer of the withdrawal treaty that was raised by some members of the EU Parliament, and I wondered what your thinking was on that, as I'd not read anything about that before. And is there another question? Uh, yes, um, gentlemen over uh, there. There's been a lot of uh, discussion about the constitutional uh, position of Scotland under uh, the UK constitution. What is the EU constitutional issue regarding Northern Ireland and its relationship with the South under the Good Friday Agreement. Does that have a constitutional knock-on effect into EU law? And I think there was one question further down here. Um, could you wait for the microphone? Thank you. I believe um, the Prime Minister has ex expressed uh, the intention of the government to withdraw from the ECHR as well as the jurisdiction of the ECJ. So if that happens, it would actually make Article 8 meaningless from the point of view of EU citizens in the, in the UK, but they will still be, the UK citizens might still be protected in other EU countries. Um. Thank you. That, my answer to the question on, on the role of the Court of Justice, um, I haven't read that particular uh, press comment or, or that particular report, uh, but I assume it is a reference to the procedure I was referring to, namely the possibility uh, for any member state and for any institution to ask for the European Court of Justice opinion on whether the withdrawal agreement is compatible with the uh, EU treaties. Uh, and that's a, a procedure which is now very frequently used for any uh, sensitive international agreements. Uh, it's been used for the Singapore Agreement. It's going to be used for uh, CETA because the Belgian government uh, is going to request an opinion. Um, so uh, I, I certainly wouldn't exclude that, um, that the court is asked for its, uh, for its opinion. Um, whether that means that it has the final say on Brexit, I wouldn't go as far as that. It has the final say on determining whether uh, the withdrawal agreement complies with, with, with constitutional principle, with EU constitutional law. And if it doesn't, uh, there, is a, there is a provision which says then that um, either the agreement must be renegotiated or it, it has to be uh, concluded uh, uh, with the procedure of uh, approval by every member state. So it can be the opinion can, in principle, be overridden by a unanimous act of all the member states, but that has never been done, and I think that would be quite exceptional. Um, uh, so there is certainly scope for that. The constitutional position of, of Scotland and, and Northern Ireland, um, we, um, we're not sure exactly how much we're going to say in the, in the paper, in the final version, not too much probably, about the uh, nice question whether, in fact, it is a question of European Union law and of Article 50 uh, to review whether the withdrawing member state is, uh, is withdrawing in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. On one view, you could say, well, yes, for example, the EU Court of Justice could look into that because Article 50 says that uh, uh, withdrawal uh, follows a decision uh, in accordance with the member state's constitutional requirements. So there's a reference to those requirements uh, uh, and so they are, in that sense, part of EU law. Um, that would be, I think, uh, really quite exceptional and possibly um, a very difficult road for the European Court of Justice to, uh, uh, to, to sort of take, uh, because I think the general understanding is that where the treaties refer to, to, to national constitutional requirements, it really is for each member state to determine what they are. 
Um, but if there were to be some EU oversight of these constitutional requirements, the Sewell Convention would be a very nice, um, would become a very nice issue. The, the Supreme Court has said that the Sewell Convention cannot be judicially enforced, uh, but you could argue it, it is nevertheless a constitutional requirement to uh, respect the, the, the Sewell Convention. So it might have even more status in EU law than in, in, in domestic law. But that's, uh, that's, with, uh, that's a little mischievous on my part, I think. Um, and of course, European Convention on Human Rights, absolutely. If the UK were to withdraw from the European Convention, I hope not, um, then of course the protection of the Convention would completely fall away and you would have um, in future um, no, um, no other protection than that provided by UK legislation. Very simple. But uh, uh, I don't think there's any plans to do that in this Parliament and uh, hopefully also not in the next Parliament. I think there are plans to do it in the next Parliament, <laughs> but uh, we have to face that one when we come to it, I suppose. Good. Well, I think we have um, had some interesting questions too. Thank you very much for the questions. And once again, I think an uh, enormous uh, vote of thanks for our lecture this evening, which was really, um, I think for many of us, uh, a revelation of the kinds of issues that we are facing. Thank you very much. Thank you.